some longer time viewers will know that I have a love-hate relationship with General Motors. Sometimes I love GM and sometimes I hate GM, but as soon as another opportunity arises to shit on GM, I sure as hell take it. With the recent news of Cadillac making the umpteenth return to Europe with the all-electric Lyric, much like how I predicted it in an earlier episode, it begs the question. Were they ever gone? And if so, what happened? Why did it leave? Welcome everyone to episode 57 of the Automotive History series, where we are going to take a closer look at GM's attempt at trying to conquer Europe in the early 2000s, but failing spectacularly. By the late 1990s, GM was doing well. Chevrolet was going strong as ever, Pontiac started to slide into an identity crisis, Oldsmobile was already deep into an identity crisis, and both Buick and Cadillac only appealed to those over 75 years old. But that was the USA side of the story. GM wanted to shake things up a bit for the new millennium and also had a desire to get a stronger position on the European market, since it had the same volume as the US. And the Opel and Vauxhall brands that were already there who weren't going to cut it. Now, GM had been selling American cars in Europe since the 1930s, and especially in the post-war years, there was an appetite for the real Detroit steel, with all its style, power and luxuries. But by the 1970s, 80s and 90s, that image had faded, and so did total sales. It was time to bring some of GM's American brands back into the picture on the European mainland. I say reintroduction, but that sounds like the American divisions had left Europe before, which wasn't true. The fact is that American cars were slow sellers in Europe because of various reasons. There was no reason for that car to be on sale in Great Britain at all. Of course, you have the big car doesn't fit tiny European streets argument, but that's not the universal truth. To the core, American cars are just a bit different than European cars. They handle different, have different style, and above all, the weight, fuel consumption and engine displacement is what matters most to Europeans, that mostly buy the cars with a wallet and not their heart. It depends on the country, but to give you an example, Cadillac had a great year if they managed to sell more than five cars, at least here in the Netherlands. So GM was looking to offer a complete range of cars in Europe, with some American cars blended in there for good measure that would better suit the European taste. To get that going, GM had a very confusing and intricate plan to bring Europe a wide selection of cars and brands, often through rebadging and cross-platform sharing. Join me on a little tour to the inner brainwaves of GM's marketing machine and rebadging strategies. First and foremost, GM already had German Opel for mainland Europe and Vauxhall in the UK. Through rebadging, these companies are effectively the same and are considered European with a European lineup, so mostly compact cars. Through a partnership with the South Korean car company, GM already sold Deu models in Europe and decided that the American Chevrolet would replace it as a bottom-of-the-barrel economy brand, one year onto the next, and Deu would become Chevrolet. Now, America's premier sports car, the Chevrolet Corvette, could of course no longer be associated with a budget brand, and GM decided to make a separate brand out of it. Next up is Pontiac. Now, Pontiac was never officially sold in Europe, but did find its way through, through rebadging and platform sharing with Opel. And the same goes for the American Saturn brand, which also had a relationship with Opel. Next up is Oldsmobile. That company died in 2004, so we won't be talking a whole lot about it. Then we have Buick. Not many American Buicks made it overseas, but some Buick models were once again shared with Opel. And then we have GM's prestige luxury brand Cadillac, and GM had some serious plans to convince Europeans that the Cadillac should be their next Mercedes. This was also around the same time GM started with the god-awful military-grade plastic garbage bin Hummer, and thought it could also fit, quite literally, in Europe. And last but not least, GM called in the Vikings from the north by buying the struggling Swedish Saab and let them fiddle around with Cadillac, Opel and Chevrolet. Let's analyze this intricate setup a bit more by going deeper into the brands one more time, shall we? So, what Jim could have done is bring some of its larger, slightly upscale American Chevrolet models over to Europe, and to some extent they did, but GM decided to reintroduce Chevrolet as Deu. Part 2. Whoa. 
Next year, Daewoo are changing their name, and I'm not joking, to Chevrolet. That's a brilliant idea. Before that, Europeans were getting treated on such wonderful cars like the Deu Lassetti and the Matisse, one year onto the next, and these are all called Chevrolet and proudly feature the bowtie badge. Now, we car enthusiasts can't keep up with these changes, but let's not forget that the typical Deu Matisse buyer is your Aunt Jenny, who's very easily distressed, mind you. Can you picture her driving a Deu to a trusty old Deu dealer for maintenance, only to find out if they have become a. Uh, a a ch a Chevrolet dealer, or however you pronounce it, she'd be upset as hell because she doesn't drive a Chevrolet. She drives a Deu, and she's convinced that the mechanics in the workshop don't know anything about her precious little Deu. Jokes aside, the rebadging was quite direct. The Deu Carlos became the Chevrolet Carlos, the Deu Lassetti became the Chevrolet Lassetti, and what is arguably the most notable of the bunch is the Chevrolet Epica, in other parts of the world sold as the Deu Tosca. If you chose the right package, you get a straight six engine that was transversely mounted. Hmm, interesting. The Epica was supposed to be a large sedan that was also budget-friendly, a concept that many Europeans don't understand. By presenting Chevrolet as the ultimate basement bargain brand with cheap Picano boxes, that put the ultimate American sports car, the Chevrolet Corvette, in a tough position. Here you are, celebrating your hard work by finally buying a Chevrolet Corvette, only for the neighbors to point a laugh at you because they also have a Chevrolet. It's a Matisse. But it's still a Chevy. So GM decided to rebrand Corvette as... Corvette. No, seriously. <laughs> For a while, it was a separate brand. Here in the Netherlands, you could buy a Corvette. Like, j just Corvette, with no Chevy name in sight. Next up is Pontiac. Now, Pontiac was never officially sold in Europe, but there is an interesting triangular relationship between Pontiac, Opel, and Saturn. One great example is the sports car, sold as the Pontiac Solstice, and also rebadged to become the Opel GT and the Saturn Sky. And that quickly brings me to Saturn, where by the mid-2000s, half of its entire lineup consisted of rebadged Opel models. The Saturn Aura was a rebadged Opel Vectra, the Saturn Astra was a direct rebadge of the Opel Astra, and even built outside the US, it was constructed in Belgium, and last but not least, GM rebadged the Opel Antara crossover as the Saturn View crossover, uh, with a little bit of Chevrolet Captiva thrown in there for good measure. As mentioned, Oldsmobile ceased to exist in 2004, right before GM's plans for Europe had begun. But I wanted to mention them, as some Oldsmobiles made it to Europe a couple years before. In the late 90s, GM decided to bring over the Alero and sell them as Chevrolets over here, in the laziest way possible. I've talked about these cars before, but just take a look. This one is currently for sale over here, and GM didn't even bother to change the logos. See, it says Chevrolet on the back, along with the Oldsmobile logos. In the same late 1990s, Buick was also somewhat active in Europe. A few park avenues found their way over here, along with one or two Riviera sports coupes that had wandered off. Buick was not part of GM's big European plans, although somehow a bunch of Buick enclaves were imported and presented as large and luxurious people carriers, for whatever reason. This doesn't mean that Buick wasn't completely forgotten, however. They already had a long-lasting relationship with Opel, going as far back as the 70s, where GM would sell Opels through Buick dealers in the US. This also means that some Opels shared models with Buick. And so we arrive at GM's cream of the crop, Cadillac. Now, as luck would have it, right around the time GM rolled out its plans for Europe, Cadillac was busy reinventing itself by moving away from the 90s retirement communities on wheels and adopt European styling, handling and performance through the so-called art and science design movement. In fact, GM was so convinced that these new sporty Cadillacs would not only beat the Germans in the US, but also in the Heimat, Germany. I have an entire two-part episode about why this idea wasn't going to work as time and time and again this approach failed, but GM wouldn't listen and continue anyway. 
No Escalade would find its way to Europe, but the nice selection of European-sized Cadillacs would do the trick. And so the Cadillac CTS was imported, along with the SRX crossover, which was considered a huge SUV by European standards. But here is where it gets really interesting. Caddy not only offered some of its American models, but also an entirely unique model exclusively for the European market, the Cadillac BLS. This is the first and also the last entirely European Cadillac, and is also the car that is featured in the thumbnail. I, I am serious. My fellow American viewers may have never heard of this car, and yet it exists as a sedan, but also as a station wagon. How European. According to GM, BLS stood for B-segment luxury sedan, but I call it, um, well, you get it, bullshit. I don't know what B-segment GM was referring to, but the only B-segment I know is the so-called subcompact car segment, which this car isn't. In fact, this car, in terms of size, was a direct successor of the Cadillac Cimarron, and the predecessor of the current day Cadillac CT4. Now, of course, the BLS was so European that it was actually a Saab 93 underneath, and this is where our next brand, Saab, steps into the picture. GM rebodied Saab's exterior and slightly changed the interior design, but that was about it. In the meantime, GM was screwing around with Saab, promised a lot, but delivered uh, not a whole lot. Except for some new models based on some other cars of the GM parts bin. As mentioned, the Saab 93 shared part with the Cadillac BLS and to some extent the Opel Vectra, but also the Saab 97X SUV. That's quite a rare sight, but based on the same platform that also produced the Chevy Trailblazer, Oldsmobile Bravada and the GMC Envoy. And last but not least, for those that couldn't care less about GM's European aspirations and wanted the real deal, an authentic slice of real 100% American processed military grade freedom on wheels, the Hummer. Because sure, Hummer would definitely fit in Europe, right? Well, the car actually experienced some brief popularity as it was seen as a gaudy in-your-face mobile for gaudy in-your-face people. Either people that were rich, pretended to be rich, or saw the car as another attempt to desperately cry for attention, bought one. By 2005 and 2006, GM had fully laid down their strategy in the hopes of conquering Europe. Chevy would take on Fiat and Skoda. We think there's a lot of upside from there. We've got a lot of new products that are helping us. The Chevrolet Sky looks pretty good right now. And Cadillac would crush the Germans. The European buyers that are interested in Cadillac certainly want to stick out, to be different, to make a bit of a statement that they haven't elected to buy just another European vehicle. Can you imagine what it would cost to realize this strategy? Countless brochures, marketing campaigns, setting up dealer networks, dealer restructuring, brand restructuring. You start to wonder if it wouldn't be cheaper to just, I don't know, invest it to make better cars? Let just Opel do all the work? And so things were a bit slow in the first few years. Some Chevy models were selling well, mostly because they already laid down the foundations, but Caddy and Hummer sales were slow. But you know what? Give it some time so that Europeans can get used to it. In a couple years, uh, so 2008 or 9, things will get better. Tri uh oh. One financial crisis after another. Lowering gas prices, falling home prices, and rising unemployment. Everyone else is watching and they're seeing these big negative Thanks, numbers Lois. and their confidence gets affected. To add insult to injury, Europe, the US and practically half the entire world was caught up in the crisis of 2008 and the following big recession. Who would have thought a crash such as this put the general on his knees? After spending loads of money on strategies and owning so many brands, GM lost it all and went bankrupt in 2009. There are quite a few quality videos out there that go deep into what led to GM's bankruptcy, but the company managed to make it through thanks to some sweet government bailout money, the same government GM otherwise hates, as it always comes up with these nitpicky little rules regarding emissions and safety, which isn't good for business. But in order to receive that money, GM had to do some serious cost-cutting and reorganizing, as the current state of affairs was ridiculous. 
and reorganizing they did, as GM decided that its European efforts were not worth the hassle considering the very limited returns, and decided to quit altogether. Let's have another look at this overview and for the third time go over the brands and see what happened to them. After the crisis, GM decided to keep Chevrolet a little longer in Europe, especially its smaller offerings like the Chevy Spark and the Chevy Aveo were somewhat popular and were eventually joined by the hybrid Chevrolet Vault, which was also sold as a rebadged Opel Impera. But by 2016, Chevrolet left Europe and wouldn't return. Some of the Chevy leftovers were then sent to, surprise surprise, Opel. The Spark was now sold as the Opel Carl and the Vauxhall Viva. And yet, they aren't completely gone. There's still a Dutch Chevrolet website, and according to the website, I can buy a brand spanking new Corvette. And here I am, thinking Corvette was a separate brand. Right, GM? Anyway, I invite you to come along with me to search for how to buy a Corvette, because I got no clue where, what, how to get one here. The whole triangular relationship between Opel, Pontiac and Saturn was scrapped as both Pontiac and Saturn were discontinued by GM in 2010. The same can also be said about Oldsmobile. Buick is a bit more interesting, however. As mentioned, the cars were not officially sold in Europe, but there was a bit of crossbreeding between Buick and Opel. The Buick Regal was an Opel Insignia, the Buick Cascada was an Opel Cascada, and the Buick Encore was an Opel Mocha. And so we arrive at Cadillac. GM had high hopes that Cadillac would dominate the European luxury car market. But when I told you that before GM launched its European effort, Caddy had a good year if they sold more than 5 Caddies. After the launch of the strategy, Caddy dealers had a good year if they managed to sell more than 4 Caddies. There are various reasons why caddies didn't catch on in the EU, despite offering smaller sized cars and station wagons. We Europeans are a difficult bunch that like to stick to our own brands. We have this Dutch expression that goes something along like, unknown makes unloved. What we don't know, we don't buy. And well, the only memory we had of Cadillac were the float boats that your rich uncle drove back in the 60s. And why would you buy a sporty caddy anyway when you have three Germans at your disposal? And so the crisis of 2008 also didn't do the company any favors. Even if there was one single buyer that had the slightest interest in getting a BLS, he was immediately turned away by the recession because of resale value. Please do sink your money into a depreciating asset, but when you do, please make sure that it has four chrome rings on it. Cadillac also left the European market in 2015. But guess what? According to the Dutch website, Cadillac is still alive and kicking and you can buy an XT4 today. And that brings us to Saab, which turned into a Saab, uh, uh, Saab story. GM wanted to get rid of it and found a suck, uh, buyer, the Dutch sports car company Spiker. Now, what gave Spiker the idea that they could run a full-size car company while they made like, what, five sports cars? I have no clue, but you know what happened after that. GM found a buyer and didn't care anyway. And so the last company left is Hummer, and should it even be mentioned, it was cancelled in the US and also cancelled in Europe in 2010. Maybe, just maybe, it wasn't the right car for Europe, and for good reason. Most people found the Hummer an oversized four-wheeled middle finger to society and everything that was considered holy. In fact, there were a bunch of city councils that were trying to ban Hummers from city centers. Heck, in some countries you weren't even able to drive a Hummer because due to its excessive weight, local laws defined the Hummer as, a, as an actual freight truck, like a full-size freight truck, and you needed a special license to drive a freight truck. So, after the recession, bailout and some restructuring, GM planned to leave Europe for good. Call it a failed experiment. What was supposed to bring in more money became a very costly and confusing endeavor. For the record, I mostly talked about it from a Dutch perspective, and I can't say that what happened here happened in all of Europe, and I wouldn't be surprised if there were some other European countries where GM is still active. But in most countries, the fairy tale was over by 2015. GM returned to what worked best before the whole endeavor took place, by just keeping it at Opel and Vauxhall, and throw them every so often an American model their way through rebadging or platform sharing. But even that didn't seem to work out. 
By 2017, GM decided to completely embed in Europe by selling Opel and Vauxhall to PSA. Uh, that's like the General Motors of Europe, owning such brands like French Peugeot and Citroën. Now, I don't want to point any fingers or name names, but it's rather remarkable to see that all the while GM owned Opel, it lost money year after year for 18 years straight. And as soon as the first year ended that Opel was under new PSA management, it turned a profit. One would believe that GM had left Europe for good since 2015, but guess what? They're back! At the time of the release of this video, it has been revealed that GM has plans to bring back Cadillac to Europe by bringing over its fully electric Lyric. The first Cadillac house has opened in Switzerland. Now, I wish both Cadillac and GM good luck. In my eyes, for the European buyer, Cadillac is probably on the same level as some of the Chinese brands we have seen recently. The name Cadillac just doesn't ring a bell anymore. Now, much like the Chinese, I think GM hopes to sell a bunch of them simply because of the financial deals and tax advantages you get when you own an EV. It doesn't really matter what you buy as long as it's electric. But these advantages will eventually phase out by the mid to late 2020s. And I wouldn't be surprised if us Europeans immediately turn back to the Germans or some other well-known European or Asian brand because resale value! I said it before and I'll say it again, GM, will you ever learn? You might want to take a look at some of this guy's videos or, you know, hire him as an advisor or chairman for the EU division. But until then, good luck GM, it's not like you haven't tried before.